Congratulations. The fact that you're reading this means you've taken on one giant step closer to surviving to your ninth birthday. Yes, you. Sitting there, leaping through these pages. Do not put this book down. I'm dead serious. Your life can depend on it. This is my story. The story of my family. But it could just be as easily as your story, too. We're all in this together. Trust me on that. I've never done anything like this. So I'm just trying to jump in. And you try to keep up. Okay. I'm Max. I'm 14. I live with my, I live with my family. Who are five kids not related to me by blood. But still, it's totally my family. We're... Well, we're kind of amazing. I'll just sound too full of myself. But we're like nothing you have ever seen before. Basically, we're pretty cool, nice, smart, but not average in any way. The six of us, me, Fang, Iggy, Nudge, the gas man, and Angel, we were made on purpose by the sickest, most horrible scientists you could possibly imagine. They created us in ex as an experiment. An experiment where we ended up only 98% human. But those 2% had a big impact, let me tell you. We grew up in a science lab prison called the school. In cages, like lab rats. It's pretty amazing we can think or speak at all. But we can, and so much more. There was only one other school experiment that made the past infancy. Part human, part wolf, all predator. They're called erasers. They're tough smart and hard to control. They look human, but when they want to, they are capable of morphing into two wolfmen, complete with fur, fangs, claws, and, and claws. The school used them as guards, police, and executioners. To them, we're six moving targets, pretty smart enough to be, to be a fun challenge. Basically, they want to rip our throats out and make sure that one never finds out about us. But I'm not lying down just yet. I'm telling you, right? The story could be about your, you or your children. If not today, then soon. So please, please take this seriously. I'm risking everything that matters by telling you. But you need to know. Keep reading. Don't let anyone stop you. Max. And my family. Hang. Iggy. Nudge. The Gasman. And Angel. Welcome to our nightmare. The funny thing about facing a minimum death is that it really sets everything else into perspective. Take right now, for instance. Run. Come on. Run. You know you can do it. I go deep lung pools of air. My brain was on hyperdrive. I was searching for my life. My one goal was to escape. Nothing less mattered. I was being scratched ribbons by a briar I'd run in through. No biggie. My bare feet hitting every sharp rock, rock root, pointed stick. Not a problem. My lungs aching for air. I could deal. As long as I could put as much distance as me as possible between me and the erasers. Yeah, erasers. Mutants. Half men, half wolves. Usually armed. Always bloodthirsty. Right now, they were after me. See? That sums everything into perspective. Run. Faster than they are. You cannot run anyone. I've never been this far from the school before. I was too totally lost. Still, my arm was pumped by my sides. My feet crashed the underbrush. Uh, my eyes scanned ahead anxiously through the half light. I could not run them. I could find a play with enough space for me to. Oh no. Oh no. The earthy bang of bloodhounds on the scent rail on the railed through the trees, and I felt sick. I could not run men. All of us could. Even Angel, and she's only six. One of us could not run a big dog. Dogs, dogs, go away. Let me live another day. They were getting closer. Dim light filtered in through the woods in front of me. A clearing? Please. Please. A clearing could save me. I burst through the trees, chest heaving, a thin sheet of cold sweat on my skin. Yes. No. Oh, no. I skidded to a halt. My arm was waving, my feet backpedaling in the rocky dirt. It wasn't a clearing. In front of me was a cliff, a sheer face of rock that dropped down to an unseeable floor hundreds of feet below. And back of me were woods full of jolling bloodhounds and psycho racers with guns. Both options stank. The dogs were yelping excitedly. They found their prey. Moy. Looked over the deadly drop. There was no choice, really. If you were me, you'd have done the same thing. I closed my eyes, held up my arms, and let myself fall over the edge of the cliff. 
The wretches screamed angrily, the dogs barking hysterically, and then all I could hear was the sound of the air rushing past me. It was so dang full. Dang peaceful. For a second, I smiled. Then, taking a deep breath, I unfold my wings as hard as fast as I could. Thirteen feet across, pale tan with white streaks and some freckly looking brown spots. They caught the air, and all suddenly yanked upward, hard, as if a parachute had just opened. Yow! Note to self, no sound of unfurling. Wincing, I pushed down with all my strength, then pulled my wings up, then pushed downward again. Oh my god, I was flying, just like I'd always dreamed. The cliff floor, tripped in shadow, receded beneath me. I laughed and surged up toward it, feeling the pull of my muscles, the air whistling through my secondary feathers, the breeze drying on the sweat of my face. I started up past the cliff, past the startled hounds and the furious erasers. One of them, hairy faced, fang shipping, works his gun. A red dot of light appeared on my torn nightgown. Not today, you jerk, I thought, bearing sharply west so the sun wouldn't be in his hate crazed eyes. I'm not going to die today. I jolted upright in bed, gasping, my hand over my heart. I couldn't help checking my nightgown. No red laser dot. No bullet holes. Fell back on my bed, limp with relief. Jeez, I hated that dream. It was always the same. Running away from the school, being chased by erasers and dogs, me falling off a cliff, then suddenly whoosh, wings, flying, escaping. I was woke up feeling a second away from death. Look to self. Give subconscious a pep talk. Read better dreams. It was chilly, but I pushed myself out of my cozy bed. I threw on a clean sweatsh. Amazingly, now just put the put the laundry away. Everyone else was still asleep. I couldn't have I could have a few minutes of peace and quiet. Get up on the day. I glanced around the hall windows on the, on the way to the kitchen. I love this view. The morning sunlight breaking over the crest of the mountains. The clean sky. The deep shadows. The fact that I could see no sign of any other people. We were high on the mountain. Safe. Just me and my family. Our house was shaped like an E. Turned on the inside. The bars of the E were cantilated on stilts out over the steep canyon. So for the tunnel window, I felt like I was floating. On a cool scale from 1 to 10, this house is an easy 15. Here, my family and I could be ourselves. Here, we could live free. I mean, literally free. As in, not in cages. Long story. More on that later. And of course, here's the best part. No grown-ups. When we first moved here, the bachelor had taken care of us. Like a dad. He'd saved us. None of us, none of us had parents. But Jeb had come as close as possible. Two years ago, he disappeared. I knew he was dead. We all did, but we didn't talk about it. No, we were on our own. Yep, no one telling us what to do, what to eat, when to go to bed. Well, except me. I'm the oldest, so I try to keep things running as best as I can. It's a hard, thankless job, but someone has to do it. We don't go to school, either, so thank God for internet, because otherwise we wouldn't know nothing. But with no schools, no doctors, no social workers knocking on our door. It's simple. If no one knows about us, we stay alive. I was shuffling around for food in the kitchen, when I was sleepy something shuffling behind me. Morning, Max. Morning, Gazzy, I said as a heavy-lidded eye eight-year-old slumped at the table. I rubbed his back and dropped a kiss on his head. He'd been the gasman ever since he was a baby. What can I say? The child has something funky with his digestive system. A word to the wise. Stay up, wind. The gasman blinked up at me, his gorgeous blue eyes surrounded to trusting. What's for breakfast? He asked, sitting up. His fine blonde hair stuck up all over his head. Reminded me of a fledging sunny feathers. Um, it's a surprise, I said, because I had no idea. I'll pour juice. The Gasman offered, and my heart swelled. He was a sweet, sweet kid, and so was his little sister. He and his short angel were the only blood siblings among us, but we were all family anyway. Soon Iggy, tall and pale, slouched in the kitchen. Eyes closed, he fell into our beat-up couch with perfect aim. The only time he had trouble being blind was when one of us forgot to move the furniture or something. Hey, Ig, rise to shine, I said. Bite me.
He mumbled sleepily. Fine. Miss breakfast. I was sitting up in the fridge with naive hope. Maybe the food fairies had come. In the back of my neck prickled. I strained quickly and spun around. Will you quit that? I said. Pink always appeared silently like that, out of nowhere, like the dark shot had come to life. He regarded me calmly, dressed and alert, his dark, overlong hair hair pushed back. He was four months younger than me, but already four inches taller. Quit what? He asked calmly. Breathing? I rolled my eyes. You know what? With a grunt, he started staggered upright. I'll make eggs, he announced. I guess if I was more of a thumbbot, it would bother me than a, that a blind guy, six months younger than I am, could cook better than I could. But I'm not, so I didn't. I surveyed the kitchen. Breakfast was well underway. Fang, you set the table. I'll go get an Arjunian roll. The two girls tried the last small bedroom. I pushed the door open to find 11-year-old Nudge asleep, tangled up in her covers. She was barely recognizable with her mouth shut, I thought Riley, but she was awake. It was called the Nudge Channel. All Nudge, all the time. Hey, sweetie, up and at em, I said, slowly shaking her shoulder. Breakfast in ten. Nudge blinked, her brown eyes struggling to focus on me. What? She mumbled. Another day, I said. Get up and face it. Groaning, Nudge thought lead herself into a couple of crumpled but technically upright position. Across the room, a thin curtain concealed one corner. Angel always liked small cozy spaces. Her bed, tucked behind the curtain, was like a nest, full of animals, books, and most of her clothes. I smiled and pulled the curtain back. Hey, you're already dressed, I said, leaning over to hug her. Hi, Max. Angel said, tucking her blonde curls out of her collar. Can you do my buttons? Yep. I turned her around and started doing her up. I never told any other. I, told, I never told the others. But I just loved, loved, loved Angel. Maybe because I've been taking care of her practically since she was a baby. Maybe because she was just so incredibly sweet and loving herself. Maybe because I'm like your little girl, said Angel, turning around to look at me. But don't worry, Max. I won't tell anybody. Besides, I love you best, too. She threw around her skinny arm around my neck and planted a somewhat sticky kiss on my cheek. I hugged her back, hard. Oh, yeah. That's not the special thing about Angel. She can read minds. I want to go pick strawberries today, Angel said firmly, scooping up a fork full of scrambled eggs. They're ripe now. Okay, Angel, I'll go with you, said the gas man, just letting that one rip a... I wanna, he let rip one of the, his unfortunate occurrences and giggled. Oh, jeez, Gazzy. I said disapprovingly. Gas, Max. And he choked out, grasping his neck and pretending to asphyxiate. I'm done, Fang said, getting up quickly and taking his plate to the sink. Sorry, the gas was said automatically, but he kept eating. Yeah, Angel. Said Nudge. I think the fresh air would do us all good. I'll go too. We'll all go, I said. Outside, it was beautiful, clear and cloudless, with the first real heat of May. We carried buckets and baskets, and Linda led us to a huge patch of wild strawberries. She held my hand. If you make cake, I can make strawberry shortcakes, she said happily. Yeah, that'll be the day when Max makes a cake, I heard Iggy say. I'll make it, Angel. I whirled. Oh, thank you, I exclaimed. Okay, I'm not a fabulous cook, but I can still kick your butt, and don't you forget it. He was laughing, holding up his hands in denial. I was just trying not to laugh, and even Fang was grinning, and the gasman looked mischievous. Was that you? I asked Gazzy. He grinned and shrugged, trying not to please with himself. The gasman had been about three when I realized he could mimic just about any sound or voice. I lost count of how many times Iggy and Fang had almost come to blows over stuff Gazzy says in their voices. It was a dark gift, and he wielded it happily. It was just another weird ability. This is what I said them. Whatever they were, they sure made life more interesting. Next to me, Angel froze and screamed. Startled, I stared down at her, and the next second, men with wolf wolfish muzzles, huge canines, and reddish, glinting eyes dropped out of the sky like spiders. Erasers! 
and it wasn't a dream.